who are just blessed with great opportunities. The privilege, for example, of, of joining the W.K. Kellogg Foundation as a program director in agriculture in 1965, and then the incredible experience of soon becoming a vice president and then in 1970 becoming the CEO of the, of the foundation with the, with the responsibility but the privilege of providing leadership for that institution at the period of dramatic, dramatic growth. And we were just talking at lunch about the challenge now in philanthropy at the Kellogg Foundation where there's tremendous growth, and now you look at what's happening to that line, and how do they cope with the realities of forward commitments to grantees, institutions, organizations that are depending on that philanthropic uh, component. So it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. So I became the uh, chief executive officer of, of what became one of the largest grant-making philanthropies, uh, literally, in the world. So if, if you want that kind of an opportunity, major in horticulture, pomology preferably, <laughs> and, and go from there. Um, you all know that our society is comprised of three major components, simplistically. The business sector, the for-profit sector, the economic generator of everything, and that makes everything else possible. And so we need a viable, vital, and it's critically evident right now that we've got concerns in that area, but that's the basic source of all that we have. So that's a very important sector. The second sector, of course, the public sector, governmental sector from the local township, village, city, county, state, federal. Again, very important that we have vital, effective public institutions, services, organizations. And then the third sector is the one that's least less clear. And we call it the nonprofit sector, the independent sector. But if you look at the quality and character of life at the community where life is lived by most of us, much of the character, the personality of the community, whether you're in a little village, in a rural town, in Grand Rapids, much of that character is a contribution of this nonprofit sector. Now they're all collaborative because our nonprofit organizations, institutions, and programs uh, depend very uh, op 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 ob obviously upon the success of the business sector for contributions and for employees who in turn can give. Philanthropy, Kathy, simplistically is the giving of time and talent as well as treasure. We sometimes think it's just that financial but equally important in making things happen. The communities, the contribution of time and talent. And you think of the leadership here in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, you look at the quality of life. You look, this is the public university. But you look at what private contributions, the Howenstein Center, the Johnson Center, the facilities we're in, this beautiful downtown campus, many of the great developments at Allendale, all a collaborative effort of private initiatives with public resources for the public benefit. So I had the privilege of being in the, in the philanthropic sector uh, and looking at uh, opportunities for, for assisting. So I'm not sure where I can be most useful. The, the, the challenge always, of course, in leadership, as you assume responsibilities again, is to have vision. I always define the leaders very simplistically as any person who identifies either an opportunity, who's opportunistic, in other words, sees an opportunity to make a difference, to do something differently, to do something better, to enrich, to touch the lives of others, sees either an opportunity or a problem, something that needs to be addressed, that needs to be changed. So a leader is simply anybody who sees either a problem or an opportunity and does something about it. And if it's a lack of recreation in the neighborhood, maybe the organizer of Little League 
or a Girl Scout program. And leadership has many manifestations in different points. So the challenge as you move into leadership responsibilities is to recognize that most of the serious problems that confront us as a society, whether we look in Grand Rapids or West Michigan or Michigan or Midwest or the country or the world, most of the problems that really concern us cannot be developed, cannot be effectively addressed by any one specialty. Now we as a society, society benefit tremendously from dramatic, incredible specialization. And if you look at the medical field, for example, and the, the miraculous things which are happening in, in surgery and, and so forth, incredible specialization. If you look at any other of the societal issues, and if you look at the agenda of President-elect Obama, and you look at the issue just domestically of the economy, you know, and of health, and of education, and of energy, and of, of uh, environmental issues, and the list goes on. All of those issues are too complex to be addressed effectively by one specialty. And so one of the keys you need to think of as you're moving forward, whether it's in finance, or business, or education, or social work, or whatever, is how as a leader, can I begin to identify the nature of a problem and then identify the others who can work with me to help deal with it? I very often use simply the, the idea of drinking water in West Michigan. Most of us drink drinking water from the underground water aquifers. I'm not sure, maybe this is West Michigan today, I'm not sure, but anyway. It's underground water that's our drinking water source. And so we have to be concerned about the quality, and preservation, and the safety of underground water. So we need specialists who know about soil types and percolation rates and the deterioration of, of viable chemicals so that they don't pollute the underground water. So we have to have all of that technical expertise. But then we have to look at the economics and then we have to look particularly at the political process, political science majors, because underground water quality is basically a responsibility of townships. And most of the influence on percolation, uh, water pollution, and where the pollutant comes in and where it ends up, and underground water streams and so forth, political issues are paramount in dealing with that issue. So, Simply to say that we need specialists in water quality inadequate to dealing with the problem. And if you look, for example, at concerns now in public education, incredible questions about how we can go about in any systematic way addressing our concerns in public. Let's simplify it, K-12. We know K is too late, don't we, educators? We've missed the first five years, which are perhaps most important of all, and we as a society just virtually ignore them completely. So that's the kind of challenge that I had the privilege of, of dealing with. Now sometimes you, you take on tough issues. I'll just share one example for a horticultural major. <laughs> that as I <clears throat> assume broader responsibilities, we won't go into the history of the Kellogg Foundation. Mr. Kellogg uh, finished school at less than eighth grade, uh, went on into business, a successful entrepreneur, committed his fortune then to philanthropy in the decade of, of the 30s, and gave all of his assets. That was 53% of the ownership of the common stock of the Kellogg Company of the Kellogg Foundation in 1935. And so, as I became the CEO of the company, of the, of the foundation, became also a director of the company. And this was in the mid 80s, that apartheid in South Africa was a very critical issue. 